About three weeks ago, my cell phone died. It had been acting up quite a bit, and there were warning signs it was about to go. But when it would act up, usually a complete shutdown and restart would solve all the issues. But on a Thursday evening three weeks ago, it did not restart. Now, the problem was the next day I was going to be traveling out of town early in the morning, and not having a phone with me made me feel quite vulnerable. But my wife kept reminding me that I should have acted quicker on getting a new phone and avoided the headache of being without one for a day or two. Now, fortunately, my older phone had insurance still covering it, and for the grand total of $24.99, I was able to get a new phone. But one of the reasons I had not earlier purchased a new one is because most of the rumors are true. I don't like spending money. But most of us know that a cell phone needs to be replaced every few years. But the replacement of that cell phone was just a very simple reminder to me that we are often going to have irritating things happen in life, and occasionally we are going to have challenges occur in a day that are significant. Because bad things do happen to good people. We know that. We believe that, but when it's happening to us, it is difficult to understand how God can use that adversity in our lives to begin to grow our faith. We can tell other people who have serious setbacks to hang in there and to keep their chin up and that God will be with them through this entire experience, but when it comes to theory, ceases to be theory in somebody else's life, and it becomes practical in our own lives, it is then a totally different story. When the boss says, after you're giving 30 years of service, I am sorry, the company is downsizing and your position is being eliminated, it's difficult. When the doctor steps into the surgery waiting room and says the cancer is spread, we were unable to get it all, it is difficult. When the tests indicate that pregnancy is not possible, it is difficult. When the phone call comes and the person calling you says, I have some bad news about your brother, he's been killed in an accident, it is difficult. Now, my goal is simple today, but not easy. I want to urge you to be faithful to God, even in adversity. Whether it is something minor, like a cell phone no longer functioning, or whether it is something major, like the death of a loved one, or a horrible medical diagnosis, you need to remain faithful to the Lord. Can you stay faithful when your heart is broken? Can you stay faithful when your bank account is zero? Can you stay faithful when your job is gone? Can you stay faithful when your spouse is gone? I've often heard David Brown say when leading worship, if you're not currently in a storm, you're either just leaving one or about to enter one. Or we are in this series on the Old Testament character of Joseph. At the age of 17, Joseph experienced a series of calamities. Now, the initial look at Joseph shows us that everything was going well for him. He had good looks, he had intelligence, he had youth. I can relate to those. But little life fell apart for Joseph temporarily. I want us to see today what happened to him and how he responded. I want us to see what his father did to him, what his brothers did against him, and how the Egyptians treated him. Now, you and I may experience various periods in our lives where we feel someone has failed us, or an entity or person has betrayed us, or we feel captured in circumstances that are less than ideal. And I want us to notice Joseph and his adversity and how he remained faithful and then see some practical lessons and how we can overcome adversity. So we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 37 where we left off last week. We began in Genesis 37 verses 1 through 11 last week and today we're going to pick it up right at verse 12 and the first thing we're going to notice is Joseph's father failed him. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. Joseph's father made a horrible decision. Joseph's ten older brothers obviously hated him. They hated him because he was their father's favorite. They hated him because he wore that special coat his father had given to him. They hated him because he had arrogantly reported a couple of visions that he had one day that he was going to rule over them. And the Bible says that his brothers could not find one good word to say about Joseph. So Joseph's father Jacob failed him because he was blind about the intensity of that sibling rivalry. Now some sibling rivalry is to be expected, 
Siblings are going to bicker occasionally. There are going to be differences. I remember a couple of uh, sisters growing up in the neighborhood where I did, and they're about 18 months apart in age, and if one of them felt slighted in any way from the other one, she would just throw a tantrum, and she would, and they, she would just kick and cry and scream. This sibling rivalry in Jacob's home was not normal. It was excessive. It was potentially violent. Joseph was 17. He was the youngest. It was 10 against 1, and their hatred of him was very intense. So the older brothers had already demonstrated a taste for violence and for murder. Three chapters earlier, their sister Dinah had been raped by the son of a local king, and the brothers went into that city to take revenge with fury. Genesis 34 verse 25 says, Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They weren't satisfied to only kill the male, of the one that had raped their sister. They killed every male in that city. And as the brothers entered that city where their sister had been raped, they seized all of the livestock. They carried off all of the wealth. They plundered everything in all of the houses. These brothers weren't just administering justice. They were seeking vengeance. They robbed, they vandalized, they abused, they murdered, and they seemed to enjoy doing it. And when their father Jacob found out about it, he didn't do anything to punish his sons. His only comment to them was, it was a bad move politically, and he knew his family would not be liked in the area any longer. So now he sends Joseph out to see how these hateful, potentially violent brothers are doing. Moms and dads, it can be difficult for us to be objective about our own children, and that is understandable. Rarely do our children tell us everything they get into, and that is probably a good thing. But when a teacher, a youth sponsor, a coach, or somebody who's with your child on a regular basis comments about a potential problem, you need to be wise enough to listen. Joseph failed to look at his family situation, real, or Jacob failed to look at his family situation realistically, and he failed to deal with the attitude and the behavior of his ten oldest sons. Jacob was completely naive about the potential for evil that lurked in his own sons, and he sent Joseph to check on him. Now, that is a decision that Jacob would regret for the rest of his life. Jacob should have been the one to go check on his sons, not Joseph. I get the feeling that. Jacob was somewhat passive in his children's lives. I think dads today are much more open and do a much better job at being involved with their children. I know the elementary schools in our district have the Watchdogs program that focuses on father figures being in the schools. I know we have several fathers from our church that participate in that program. Jacob's passivity was an issue he had his whole life, and it cost him the loss of his son Joseph, as we're going to see in a little bit. Parents need to be willing to ask the tough questions. Where are you going? Who is going with you? How long will you be there? When are you coming back? Don't be naive about the spiritual dangers that lurk within our culture. The app Life 360 is a great way to keep track of your children's whereabouts. As one of our services was ending a couple of weeks ago, a mother came up to me and we were chatting and I asked about her teenage son. I said, is he here today? And she looked at her phone and said, yes, he is. Life 360 tells me he's in the building right now. Now, I know some teens do not particularly like that app, but parents, it is not your role to be your teenager's friend. That comes later on in early adulthood. It is your role to teach and coach and when necessary to restrain the evil nature that exists in every child that obviously comes from the mother's side of the family. <laughs> Joseph, just seeing if you're awake out there. Joseph not only had some consequences in his life because of the passivity of his father, he also experienced another issue, and that is Joseph's brothers betrayed him. Look at verse 14. So he said to him, that is, Jacob said to Joseph, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers, found them near Dothan. 
Now, you would expect that Joseph might balk a bit at the idea of his dad sending him out to find his brothers out in the fields. He knew how much they hated him, but Joseph was cooperative, he was reliable, he was conscientious, and these are going to be characteristics that God is going to use in his life later when he's promoted to be the prime minister of Egypt. Joseph even went the extra mile, and when his brothers weren't found in Shechem, he traveled to where they were in Dothan. And for Joseph to travel to Dothan was about another 20 miles away. And remember, this isn't driving a car to find him. He's walking on foot. Even though Jacob wasn't the best father to any of his sons, it seems that Joseph dearly loved his dad and he'd do anything to help him. Now, later in Joseph's life, he's going to bring his family into a much more prosperous setting. Verse 18. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. They didn't like hearing about those dreams where Joseph was going to rule over them. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. You ever notice how people will do and say things in a large group they'd never say and do otherwise? Strikers on a picket line, demonstrators in a march, drunks in a bar, a losing team on a bus. And this group of ten brothers plotted to kill Joseph. Now, only one brother, Reuben the oldest, tried to stop it. Verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them, take him back to his father. While Joseph's brothers did not initially agree what to do with Joseph, they did agree they all wanted him out of their lives. Joseph is probably kind of sauntering towards the field where his brothers are. He's got this idea he's going to get this really warm welcome from them. They'd be great, very happy to see him. I think one of Joseph's weak areas was his perception of himself, and he was a bit naive. Imagine his shock when he realized this was going to be a very threatening situation to which he was entering. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. They took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Now, you remember Joseph's prized possession? It was that coat of many collars that his father had given to him, and he flaunted it in his brother's faces. He continues to flaunt it in his brother's faces. Faces. He not only goes out and tends the sheep, the flock in that coat, he walks down to Dothan, that 20 extra miles. He's got the coat on. His brothers see that coat reminding them of their father's favoritism of him. He should have taken that coat off and had never worn it. And I think in that moment, he realized how much hatred there was growing within his brother's hearts. And Joseph probably thought in his own mind that he was going to check on his brother's welfare and he was not comprehending his father's deeper concerns about his brother's sinful behavior and what seemed like just an ordinary day suddenly turned into a disaster and a threatening situation. Now, we're not told here about Joseph's emotional response, but we learn later, 30 years later, when he's reunited with his brothers that he pleaded with them for his life. Think of how Joseph must have felt at this moment. Sure, he'd had disagreements with his brothers. They, were just, they weren't just trying to scare him now. This was for real. They ripped off his coat. They tore it to pieces. They beat him up. They threw him into the cistern, and then they laughed at him for begging to come out. He's bruised. He's bleeding. He's crying out for help, and they ignored him. He had no clue whether he was going to live or die. An ordinary day can suddenly become a horrible experience. The crash occurs at the intersection, and you're stuck in the vehicle. A phone call comes that your child has a concussion due to an accident of practice. Your dad suddenly has a massive heart attack. The diagnosis you thought would be normal turns out to be significant, and your life is suddenly in an uproar. But while Joseph's life is in an uproar, notice what his brothers do. Verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Now, you have to be pretty callous to plot the murder of your brother, and then you go out to dinner. So they got ready to go and to sit down and eat dinner, and during the meal, they hear some traders coming down the road, and they realize not only can they get rid of their brother without killing him, they can make some money on this deal as well. Verse 26. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern, sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. 
I wonder if Joseph sat there in that cistern thinking, I should have kept those dreams to myself. I should have not opened my great big mouth. I never should have said anything about my brothers bowing down before me. They didn't like hearing that. But then above his head, Joseph begins to hear some talking. A conversation is occurring, and it's not just the voices of his brothers that he is hearing. He hears a few phrases maybe. We'll sell him to you. Well, how much? Trade, trade you for some camels. Joseph is wondering what is going on up above his head. And then one of the brothers is lowered down with a rope into the pit, and he grabs Joseph. And probably in that moment, Joseph is thinking his brother is just pulling a prank on him, and everything's going to go back to normal. But as he's left, lifted up to that level ground, the traders grab Joseph. And they started examining him. They stuck their fingers in his mouth and counted his teeth. They pinched his arms to check out at the mass of muscle. The brothers made their pitch for the deal. Not an ounce of fat on this boy. He can work all day long. And the merchants huddled. And when they came back with an offer, Joseph realized what was happening. His brothers were selling him into slavery, and they're going to run off with the money. Now, one brother, Reuben, apparently didn't sit down at the meal, and I think he walked away pondering what was occurring. He was the one who wanted to take Joseph back to their father. Verse 29, when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brother and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? What a coincidence that this group of traders came along when they did. We're going to see how this coincidence became a God incident, and God is going to use it for his people three decades later. Have you ever noticed that only God can take a day that goes south and can later turn it around, and you can look back and see how he was working in it? Look at verse 31. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in his blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine to see whether it's your son's robe. Now, these brothers practiced some deception. They did not overtly lie to their father, Jacob, about what had happened, but they did not tell him the complete truth either, and they allowed their father just to draw his own conclusion. Verse 33, he recognized and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. I think this is where we start to see some of the dysfunction of the family occurring. I think Reuben was willing to stand up and tell the truth, but I suspect his other nine brothers went to him and said, If you open your mouth and you say anything to our father about what really happened, you'll be the next one to go down into a pit. And Jacob was devastated about what he thought had happened to his favorite son. Verse 34, Jacob tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth. He mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I'll continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Joseph's life suddenly took a turn he was not expecting. See, a few hours earlier, everything was looking up for him. He had a new coat. He had a pampered place in the family. He dreamed his brothers and his parents would look up to him. But what goes up must come down. And Joseph's life came down with a hard crash. He was put down by his siblings. He was thrown down into an empty well. He was let down by his brothers. And he was sold down the river as a slave. Verse 36, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Life can pull you down. It can pull you down to the last dollar. It can pull you down to the custody hearing. It can pull you down to the bottom of the pecking order in the company. It can put you down on your back. It can put you down on your luck. And life pulled Joseph down to Egypt. Notice how his captors brutalized him. Well, I'm sure Joseph is glad to be alive at this point. His hands were tied. He's being treated like an animal. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him next. And he found life can be reversed quickly. You've seen that happen before. Life reversed quickly. You feel a lump while showering. A phone call comes that not only alters your day, but your entire life. The boss walks into your office, and it's not good news. You find a note from your marriage partner leaving you. You suddenly find yourself waking up in ICU. Joseph is 17. He's young. He's healthy. He's wealthy. He's pampered by his father, and suddenly he finds himself tied up on his way to Egypt. He's not known there, and he's sold again, and this time he is sold from this band of, of merchants to a guy named Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was Pharaoh's chief executioner. He was a very tough man. If you are a slave, you didn't want to be sold to a man like this. Potiphar knew how to teach obedience, and a new slave would be trained to learn respect for authority 
authority. Joseph would have had the worst of the sleeping quarters. He's given the most meaningful of all the tasks. And the once pampered Joseph is now taking out the trash. He's scrubbing out the latrines. He's carrying huge loads on his back in the heat of the desert. And he finds himself all alone in a foreign country. But one thing Joseph did, he stayed faithful. He made the best of a bad situation, and we'll later see how God used Joseph's faithfulness to his benefit. Now skip over to chapter 39. 38, there's a little sidetrack to the story. But go over to Genesis 39, verses 1 and 2. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials... The captain of his guard brought him down from the Ishmaelites who had taken him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Leslie Flynn wrote a book from many years ago called God's Man in Egypt and he points out that Joseph could have gone around saying, no speaky Egyptian, no speaky Egyptian. These aren't my kind of people. This isn't my kind of place. I don't deserve to be treated like this. I'm not a slave. I don't want anything to do with this culture. But Joseph didn't say that. He made the best of a bad situation. Joseph was planted in Egypt, and he went to work. He learned the language. He learned the culture. He observed the people. He began to find favor with his master because he worked hard. Look at verse 3. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. He became Potiphar's personal attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted in his care everything he owned. Everything he owned. Joseph had control over Potiphar's life in everything he owned. You in a situation you don't like right now? Maybe it's your place of work. It just may be that God has you where he wants you and you are the person there to show others how to be faithful. Is it your status of health? It may be you're going for some treatments and you're going there so other people around you can see your faith and your attitude and their faith can grow too. Joseph was faithful to the Lord in his circumstances in Egypt and even though he didn't understand why he was there, he went to work, he was faithful as a slave and he began to be promoted. Now, here are four lessons about coping with adversity. Number one, prosperity is temporary. Prosperity is temporary. There are many of you in this room right now that your life is going easy for you. You have no serious problems. Your health is good. Finances are good. Your family's together. You be thankful for that because it may not always be that way. When you get up every morning, you say, this is the day the Lord has made. I am going to rejoice and be glad in it. Because a day can change quickly. Prosperity is temporary. Number two, adversity is inevitable. Adversity is inevitable. You need to be prepared for it. The Bible says, those that live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble. I ran across a really cute story a couple of weeks ago about the late actress Helen Hayes. Uh, I remember Helen Hayes in the old movie, Herbie Rides Again. Do you remember that Walt Disney movie? Herbie, uh, the young people are going, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, go home and pull up Herbie Rides Again. She had a stellar career, and it spanned nearly 80 years of acting. Uh, in her autobiography, she tells about cooking her very first Thanksgiving dinner. She informed her husband, Charles, and her son, James, I know this is the first time I've ever cooked a turkey. If it isn't any good, I don't want anybody to say anything. We'll just get up from the table without comment, and we'll go to a restaurant to eat. Hayes said she went into the kitchen, she came back into the dining room carrying the turkey, and there was her husband and her son seated at the table with their hats and coats on. When adversity strikes, don't say, how can this happen to me? Look at other people around you. Notice faithful Christians. See how they react. Prosperity is temporary. Adversity is inevitable. And then third, effort is essential. Some Christians say, well, when adversity comes, you'll just grow. That's not always true. Some Christians buckle under adversity. Instead of getting better, they get bitter. Some walk away from their marriages. Some turn to drugs and to alcohol. Some will choose to take their life. 
I led a trip of 13 people over to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania to Sight and Sound Theater this past week to see uh, the play Jesus. And then after that, we drove over to Washington, D.C. to go to the Bible Museum and do some touring. So it was left on Monday, came back on Friday, and, and it was really a great week. The weather was perfect. It was 75 degrees and sunny and no humidity. The tourism uh, was down this week because school groups haven't had enough time to organize group trips there yet, and the summer tourism was already over. So it was just a perfect time to go, but we did run in uh, to one faux pas. The faux pas came on Tuesday afternoon. On Tuesday morning, we went to see sight, the Sight and Sound Theater, went to see the program Jesus, and it's really good. One of my friends saw my Facebook page that I put that I was there watching Jesus, and he said, is Jesus good? I mean, how do you answer that? I just texted him back and said, Jesus is always phenomenal, <laughs> you know, he's always phenomenal. And um, we went, and I'd scheduled, then after that, the group was going to go to um, a smorgasbord, and I scheduled that. I uh, wanted to be sure we went there, and so it was, you know, eat all you can for one price, and I love that, that idea, anytime you eat all you can for one price is good. And so we scheduled that, and I, I went and got my salad. I don't know why I got a salad at Amish smorgasbord. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But I was trying to at least pretend I was healthy. I'm in a group of 13 people from our church. I wanted to at least look like I was doing something right. And so I set it down. And just I took my first bite. I thought, oh, you know what? I ought to check my, mess my phone, see if I have any messages. And I'd had my phone off during the, the production of Jesus. And so I pulled my phone out, flipped it on. And sure enough, it says I'd missed a call. And there's a voicemail. And I looked. And I've got the where it can text you your voicemail. And I looked. And it said, dear Mr. Snotty. This is the Hampton Inn at North Gaithersburg, Maryland. Unless we hear from you by 10 a.m. this morning, your reservations for seven rooms for three nights are going to be canceled. It's 2.30 in the afternoon, and our reservations have been canceled. Uh, I was not a very happy camper, and so I looked at that again. I thought, I'm reading this wrong. I looked at it again, and uh, I looked at my wife sitting next to me on my left, and I said, I will be back in a few minutes, got to go deal with something. She didn't know if it was a church emergency or what. I just said, I got to go. So I went outside of the parking lot. I'm calling the Hampton Inn there, and we are going, going through what happened. And she said, well, I'm sorry, but they are already canceled. The rooms are already rebooked, and there are no rooms left in our hotel for tonight. I've got now two of our people who are going to come on back early, but I now have 11 people that need seven rooms for three nights, and we have no rooms. I was outside in the parking lot for over an hour, and my wife came out and she goes, what in the world is going on? I said, do you want to tell them or do you want me to tell them we're going to have to turn around and go home tonight? We've lost the rooms. And she looked at me and she said, you better take care of this. I'm like, I'm trying to take care of this. I am trying to take care of this. And I spent about another half hour on the phone, and the manager at the Hampton Inn was able to locate us another hotel just about two miles away, and we were able to find seven rooms for three nights at the very same price. And so it worked out. But for about two hours, I am going into a complete panic. I'm thinking, great, my first little trip I'm leading. I have really botched it up. I'm about ready to lose my cool in front of 13 of my my church members, which is not going to really look good. I'll lose my hair over this. There's something going to happen. This is not going to turn out well. But it turned out great. But the whole thing was, I couldn't just say, well, let's wait on God and see what he does. God wasn't going to make me a new reservation. If you think as a Christian you're only to wait on God, you're wrong. Joseph had to work hard before his life ever started turning around. And there are some days, if you've been in a storm of life for a long time, that all you can do is get up in the morning and you put your feet on the floor. Don't give up even when you don't understand. Joseph surely wanted to give up. He's in a foreign country. He's all alone. He has no one there to mentor him. There's no one on whom he called, but he kept working. And sometimes faithfulness is simply defined by putting your feet on the floor and saying, God, I'm not sure how you're going to do it, but I believe you'll provide what I need for today. And here's the fourth lesson. God is faithful. He may be silent, and life may seem unfair at times. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now, God does not say you'll never have a flood. He says, when the flood comes, I'll see to it you don't drown. Robert Browning Hamilton wrote, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. 
Two weeks ago, I preached about adoption, and I interviewed one of our members, Scott Durbin, an adoptee. And we have received a whole bunch of uh, emails and texts and messages from several in our church. But there was an email I received the next day on Monday afternoon that illustrates that even during severe adversity, how God was faithful to this person. And I use her email to me with her permission. Dear Paul, I want to thank you for your sermon on adoption. I always enjoy hearing you tell the story of two people who loved you as their own. Hearing adoption stories from the point of view from two men, survivors yesterday, touched me in a place in my heart that only God knows. Having been raised in an abusive home as a girl of 17 to 18 years of age, I would come to know a young man who would sexually assault me, physically and emotionally abuse me. Because abuse was a normal for my growing up, I didn't know how to protect myself and get out of this violent relationship. After being assaulted by this young man time and time again, I would go home, get into the bathtub, and run scalding hot water over my entire body. I wept and sobbed quietly so my parents would not hear me down the hallway. I cried out to the angry God that I knew and begged for forgiveness. Every time I believed this young man would never hurt me again. I became pregnant. I don't remember my thoughts or emotions during this time. I just walked in directions unknown to me, secretly. I don't remember how I found the women's clinic near OSU. I just remember walking in, a woman behind a sliding glass window, opening a glass panel and handing me a piece of paper. She said to me to let her know what procedure I wanted. I sat down in the bare office, chairs lined up in a row. I don't remember anyone else being in the waiting room. I looked at the paper, my eyes scanned the abortion procedures by name, and I realized I was in the wrong place. I walked to the window. The woman slid the glass panel back open and I said, I'm keeping my baby. She never said a word to me. She took the piece of paper and slid the glass panel shut. I don't even remember what all of this meant to me. Time wasn't. I walked back to my own car. I drove back home. I don't remember the timeline, but I told my baby's father that I was pregnant. In the same horrible tone, he said, you can't keep it. Where I got the strength, or even the words for that matter, I simply said, I am. As my baby grew in my womb, I suffered abuse at the hand of his father. I had a determination that was not my own to protect the life of my baby and ultimately my own life. My life during this time of abuse felt so normal because I grew up in this kind of home. What I didn't know is God would take this event in my life to introduce me to love. While pregnant, not by consent or pleasure, God would demonstrate to me what love looked like, sounded like, and felt like. It would be the comfort of my loving Heavenly Father who stayed with me in the delivery room. It was my loving Heavenly Father who calmed my fears while giving birth to a beautiful, healthy, black-headed baby boy. It was then God demonstrated what would be a pivotal, life-changing time in my life. I knew love from Him. Only God could have taken what was such an overwhelming situation that my words cannot describe the horror I experienced during this time in my life. Only He could have taken this time and gave me more than I ever had. Love. His love. And the beautiful thing is, for the first time in my life, I would be able to see what love looked like, hear what love sounded like, and what it felt like. Once again, in God's wonder, he demonstrated his love in the form of a baby. Imagine that. Finally, thank you for touching my life. Another part of my being was healed. I love how God continues to heal the deep wounds of his beloved children. When trouble strikes, you be faithful to God. Because God is faithful. Jesus could have walked away from the cross. He could have given up. He could have said, I'm not doing it. I'm out of here. But he knew he had to go to the cross to do what we needed. So this morning as we prepare to participate in the Lord's Supper, as the emblems of communion are distributed, please hold them, and then we will partake together. Let's pray. Father, I'm sure that in this room today, there are people who've already had a challenging day. It may be just the challenge of getting up and getting ready to church and dealing with some of those kinds of issues. I know that in this church, there are people dealing with some significant health issues. There, there are people wondering about what's going to happen to a child right now. Uh, there are people that have lost a job and wondering how they're going to pay their bills next month. 
there are people who are being challenged uh, at work because it's getting tougher and tougher and, and they're getting more discouraged. And yet the toughest thing that ever occurred was when Jesus was willing to be obedient to you and to go to the cross. And he was faithful to his mission because you are faithful to yours. So God, as we have opportunity to participate in your supper today, may we be reminded of your faithfulness over and over again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.